I want to start off today by saying this. I'm going to, or the scripture is going to address a lot of sin today. And I want to come here, I want to let you know right from the beginning, there is no condemnation because you've sinned, if you are in Christ. No matter what it is, in Christ there is therefore now no condemnation. Why? Because he paid it all. Amen? Amen? So I want you to understand that. That no matter what you've done, it has been forgiven in Christ. This is not a condemnation ministry. This is an edification ministry. We come together to grow in the grace of God and to be edified, to be built up in our faith. So I'm not here to tear anybody, anyone down because they may have committed a particular sin. We remember our sin so we can grieve over our sin so that we don't do it again. Amen. Sin, the forgiveness of sin should bring wisdom. And the experience of the consequences of sin should give wisdom. And when we are born again, we're given the mind of Christ, which is the ultimate wisdom. So today I'm going to talk about the responsibility or duty of every believer. The responsibility of every believer. And what is it? Make sure your practice matches your position. Make sure your practice matches your position. And that is the responsibility of every believer. Let's go to 1 John 5 verse 4. We've been parked here for a long time. We may be parked here a little bit longer. Because it's not how fast you go through a thing, it's how deep you go through it. 1 John 5, verse 4, For whatever is born of God, born of the Spirit, according to John 3, 8, overcomes the world. What is the world? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. This is an irrefutable statement of fact. John the apostle did not, his, his pen didn't shake. There was no stuttering. There was no humming, humming. He made a, a, a fact that all those born of God overcome the world. In other words, all those born of God endure to the end. Amen. There is no shadow of turning with God because God saved us. We did not save ourselves. And Jesus said, all those the Father gives him, he will raise up at the last day. Aren't you glad about that this morning? Amen. Everyone God saves will never be condemned with the world because they are protected by the power of God through the gift of faith. We're, uh, don't you know if you're a believer here this morning, you're being protected by God? Did a preacher ever tell you that? Did a, did a religious group ever tell you that, that you're protected by God? No, they did. I can tell you right now, no, they didn't, because they, all they focused on was what you had to do to make yourself right with God. This God-given gift does not come alone. The gift of faith does not come alone. Good works follow those whom God has saved. God saves you in order that you may do good works. We see this in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace, and as we learned a couple of weeks ago, this is the definition of grace. The merciful kindness by which God exerting his holy influence upon the souls, turns them to Christ, keeps, what's that word? Keeps. keeps, strengthens, increases them in Christian faith, knowledge, affection, and kindles them to the exercise of the Christian values. In other words, working out their salvation. You have been saved through faith, for by grace, you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Verse nine, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. There's not near one of us up in here who can say I was saved because I did X, Y, and Z. Not one. 
But you hear people all the time saying, well, I got baptized. I heard the word and I believe it. I, no, 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 no. That's like saying, you know what? I woke up one day and decided to be born. And all of a sudden I surprised mama and there I was. <laughs> Makes no sense at all. We are saved by grace through faith. The grace and the faith are the gift. And he gives it so, to us so that we will not boast in our own works, but we will boast in God and God alone. We weren't saved because of anything good we did. We were saved because of everything God did. To those who believe in his name, he gave the right to be called the children of God. You have the right. That's, see, and let me tell you, so I'm not worried about civil rights. Not. Surprise. Because I have the godly right of being called a child of God. You, you understand that? When you fight for rights that the world, you want from the world, it's going to be all messed up. Because from civil rights came women's rights and gay rights and all this kind of, all these rights that are totally wrong. The right, the only right that matters is if you've been called a child of God. What a privilege it is to be called a child of God. With great privilege comes great responsibility. Verse 10. For we are his workmanship or new creations created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand or predestined for us to do so that we would walk in them. God saved you so that you would do good works. He predestined that you would be conformed to the image of Christ. That's why he saved us. He didn't save us so he go whoop to heaven you go. He saved us so we could be conformed to the image of Christ in the here and the now. This is how we glorify him through our good works. Let your work so shine that men will see your good. Let your light so shine that men will see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. Now. We hear this, the good works, but we forget the promise. I want to tell you, don't whistle while you work. I know those seven little fellas was used to sing this song, whistle while you work. Don't whistle while you work. Remember while you work. Remember the promise of God. And what is the promise of God? Ezekiel 36, 27. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances or walk in my statutes or to obey my commandments. So in other words, God made me a robot. No. The life of Christ in us causes us to live as he lived when he walked this earth. We don't. Now, here's the here's the difference. He did it perfectly. Why did Jesus live a perfect life? Because we could not. Mm. He lived a perfect life because we couldn't. And by grace through faith, his righteousness is imputed or credited to us. Amen. So no longer do I have to think, how long do I have to stay in church before I'm right? How many Bible verses do I need to read today before I'm, I'm acceptable to God? How many times a day do I have to pray in order to be acceptable to God? You live that way? I live that way. And it's an awful way to live. So since God has promised that the Holy Spirit would cause us, cause us, cause, we're not the cause of our goodness. It is the Holy Spirit in us. He promised that the Holy Spirit would cause us to walk according to his statutes. It is our responsibility and duty to do it. Get it? See, that's our responsibility. He's given us this. Now do it. Just like our bodies. Our bodies are the temple of God. Therefore, we take care of our bodies. We already are the temple. We don't do it to become the temple. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy God, of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, he says, take care of your body. Not in order to make it the temple of God, because it is. Now, we do this not by our own power, but through faith. The just 
shall live by faith. Faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ for our salvation. When he yelled, it is finished, did he mean this particular chapter? And now we're going to flip the page and now it's up to you? No. How many trees has man created? How many birds has, ha, 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 have mankind created? None. When God rested on the seventh day, man did not add one iota to his creation. When Jesus rested on the seventh day, man could add not one iota to his work of salvation. Amen. See, that puts it in perspective. Ephesians 4 Verse 1 says this, because of all of this, therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, this is Paul speaking, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Verse 2, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another. In other words, walk in a manner exhibiting the transforming power and fruit of the Spirit. Isn't that humility, gentleness, patience, and love? Isn't that the fruit of the Spirit? See, this is where people get twisted. A lot of people go to church because they want to see the gifts of the Spirit. You know what? I don't need to see a gift when I see the fruit. Jesus said, by the fruit, you will know them. He didn't say by the gifts, you will know them because some people can dance up and down the aisle and you think they are filled with the Holy Ghost only to find out that they molested a child many years ago. I'm telling you, I know what I'm talking about. It's not the gifts that prove you have the Holy Ghost. It's the fruit. The fruit. And it comes from the Holy Spirit. God will use the gift, yes, but that is not an indication that you say why. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we do all this in your name? He gonna say, uh, depart from me, you doers of iniquity. I never knew you. In other words, you may have exhibited the gifts, but you show sure enough didn't have the fruit. Verse three, being diligent. This is our responsibility. Being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So Colossians 3 explains it a little more. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. So we are to preserve the unity of the spirit. The unity of the spirit is love for God. The spirit produces love for God. Love for fellow believers and love for truth once for all handed down to the saints found in the word of God alone. You don't find unity in serving people. People say we need to come together and feed the hungry. We need to come together and feed the and clothe the poor. Yes, those are good things, but they are not godly things if you do not acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. We have no unity with a group of people who claim to be Christians and want us to join them in taking care of sinners when they themselves are sinners. Let the dead bury the dead. That boy woke up mean this morning. Now, understand this. As Christians, as individuals, get me now, as individuals, we do good works. It's a good work for you as an individual to give to the poor. If you know someone is hungry, we feed them regardless of what they believe. If they're hungry, what I'm saying is, we are not to do this in identity with a group of people who deny the lordship of Jesus Christ. That's what I'm saying. I'm not going to stand on a corner. I'd rather stand on a corner by myself and hand out food than stand with a group of people that affirm gay marriage and they'll think, oh, they're all the same. Amen. So what, what business does light have with darkness? What fellowship does light have with darkness? None. Oh, but we're supposed to love everybody. I do. See, 
The, the greatest love is love for God, right? So the, does God tolerate sin? Neither should we. First in ourselves and then in others. We tell them the truth. And if they don't, re what did Jesus tell? If they don't receive the truth, feed them. Hmm? If they don't receive the truth, clothe them. What do you say? Kick the dust off your feet and take away your blessing. All right. See, I, I, see, I read the Bible. Just in case you don't, I read the Bible for what it says. And sometimes it offends human sensibilities. But that's all right. Because my sensibilities were, were offended. That's what caused me to come to Christ. Amen. <laughs> Ephesians 4, 17 says this. So this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, meaning devoid of truth and appropriateness. Now, Gentile here refers to those who do not believe the unbelieving world. We are all Gentiles, but first of all, we are in Christ. We are part of the church. Everyone who is saved between Pentecost until the second coming of, of Christ is the church. That's the church. So we in the church, we're Gentiles, but we are redeemed Gentiles. Can you say amen? amen. So he said, don't walk like them. This is our responsibility. Don't walk like them. D does someone come, you know, unless you can't walk, someone aids you. But if you are fully capable of walking, you get up and do what? Walk. Why? Because of the muscles that God has given you and you walk. So he's saying, it's your response. Don't just sit there, get up and walk, but not as the Gentiles walk. In the futility of their mind, devoid of truth and appropriateness. How, mm, I saw something on the internet and this young lady, she was at the movies getting popcorn. And this whole side of the dress was gone. I flipped up that thing so fast. So it's okay for you to go. Glennis and I go to the gym. It may not look like it. I know she does. She looks like it. But you may wonder if I, <laughs> if I look like it. Amen. But when we're at the gym, I got to pray our Father who's out of heaven. I got to pray, Lord God, I will set no evil thing before my eyes. Because I don't need to look at a lady to look at what she's wearing to be able to spell her name. Y'all don't get that. Yeah, that's, that's the thing we used to say in Harlem. You can look at her thing so tight you can spell her name. Oh, y'all know what I'm talking about. Just inappropriateness. Why, why would you come out with a thong to the gym and then get mad when someone looks at you? Devoid of truth and inappropriateness. What causes an unbeliever's mind to be divorced? And then teach the daughters to do the same. And the mothers are worse. The mothers are worse. But that's a whole nother sermon. Tune in at another time. What causes an unbeliever's mind to be void of truth and, and uh, appropriate, inappropriateness? Ephesians 4, 18. Being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. Because, of the, because their hearts are hard, they are ignorant, excluded from the life of God, and are darkened into their understanding. This explains our world today. This is the world in which we live. Just, what's the word I'm looking, what's the Greek word? Stupid, yeah, that's it. Just stupid. You mean to tell me for 5,000 years, we knew that mothers only have babies. And now it's a birthing unit? Oh, I'm talking about in the halls and ways of Congress, the birthing unit. It's no longer breastfeeding, it's chest feeding. Oh, you think I'm kidding? It's chest feeding. Can a person saved by God ever again be darkened in their mind? Can a person who God saves ever again be darkened in their mind? Remember the text, all those who are born of God, all those who are born of God overcome the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Didn't we read that? 
You see, we get scriptural amnesia. We read one thing and forget the other truth. We have to first be anchored in the truth that we who are saved overcome the world by our faith, right? Okay, so can a person saved by God, born of God, ever again be darkened in their mind? Excluded from the life of God? Ignorant of the truth and knowledge of God because of the hardness of their heart? No. But a preacher will tell you that. Well, oh, you'll be careful. You might slip back into sin. You might, and you, may, you might be lost. So in other words, God is a liar. God said, all those who are given to me, Jesus said, they'll come to me and I will raise them up. Why don't they go back? Because, again, they are protected by the power of God. We got to get this. You're protected by the power of God. Every believer is protected by the power of God, by faith, through faith. Yes, Dana, you're a broken record. I'm getting tired of hearing it. You know what? I get tired of seeing all these commercials, but when I get hungry, that's what, you know what? When you're on the road, when you're on the road, why do you have all those Cracker Barrel signs? You see that crack about all of a sudden your stomach goes. <laughs> yeah, 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 let's go to crack about. And then when you get there, they have everything you need, amen. <laughs> I forgot I just said we go to the gym. <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> Verse 19 of, of Ephesians 4. And they, meaning those who are unbelievers, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensual. Here it is. Sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. Impurity with greediness, which is idolatry. In other words, the more sinful they become, they think of new ways to be sexually immoral. You just say we got 500 genders. What, what, really? 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 A little boy goes to school with, on his T-shirt says there are only two genders and he's, he's committed a federal offense. Why? Because their minds are callous. Their minds are darkness, darkened and they've been given over to their sin. See, we should understand. We say, I don't know what's going on. This is what's going on. They're lost, lost, blind. They are the children of the devil. They are caught in his web, not just because he caught them, but because they love their sin. Try to tell somebody that they need Jesus Christ and they will come after you if you start talking about, talking about this sin. As long as you start telling people, God loves you, he has a plan for you, and he will give you the best life now. And then, But start talking about sin, they'll pop you in the mouth. Amen. Talking about the most tolerant people are the most intolerant of truth. You can't even go on a college campus and speak the Bible when they want to throw you out or spit on you. People go to college campuses all the time trying to speak the truth and they'll get up and start ah, making all kinds of noise because they don't want to hear the truth. Verse 20. But here it is. Here's the grace. Here's the grace. But you, you who, you who are born of God did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus Christ, taking it the other way. Jesus Christ is the truth. And when you are taught in him through hearing the word of God, you learn about Christ. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And when you hear the word of God, it has transforming power. You are no longer like a Gentile. You no longer love the sin you used to love. You walk in the newness of life. Why? Because you are a new creation. When Peter declared that Jesus was the Christ, the son of the living God, Jesus replied, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. But my father who's in heaven again, but you did not learn Christ this way. You learn Christ from God the Father by the will of God. Listen to this. I'm going to read this and I want you to listen to this. This is John 6, 44 through 45. Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Well, people say, yeah, well, Dan, yeah, he draws people, but they won't come. You know, it's up to you. This is what it say. Yeah, he draws everybody, but it's up to you to, to decide whether or not to come. Oh, Yeah. 
He says, no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. There's no, there's no separation between the one he draws and the one he's going to raise on the last day. Is there? I want you to read it for, take, take that note, write, write it down. John 6, 44 and 35, verse 45 says, it is written in the prophets and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the father comes to me. Aren't you glad I'm not making this up? Because sometimes when it's too good to be true, it ain't. But this is true and is mm, mm, good. Verse 22 of Ephesians 4. That in reference, what did you learn? What did you learn in Christ? That in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. And that you, verse 23, and that you be renewed in the spirit, meaning the thoughts, understanding, beliefs, motives, and actions of your mind. This is how we change. You don't get changed by running around a building. You don't get changed by someone laying a hand on you. You get changed by filling your mind with the word of God. That's why you have all these people running around talking about how fell in sin, I'm falling in sin, because we do not hold on to the word of God. Amen. Now, I just noticed this. He says, and lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. Your flesh, my flesh, is not saved. Your flesh is not saved. Your flesh is not redeemed. Your flesh is the same old stinking flesh that you had before you were saved. Same. So therefore, we fight. We fight against the flesh all the time. And I'm here to hear some good news for you. You're going to fight that fight until the day you die. Why is that good news? Because it proves that you are a child of God. Only the children of God fight the flesh. Now, are there times we succumb to the flesh? Yes. Have there been times when children of God have succumbed to the flesh in a grievous way? Yes. Yes. But the consequences of a child of God and the consequences of a believer are two different things. Those who walk by the flesh, who are unbelievers, are, will be destroyed. Those who are the children of God will be disciplined by God, which will produce the peaceable fruit of righteousness. See the difference? Isn't that good? It's good. Oh, no, no. I feel like being one of them Judaizers. You better not sin. Because if you sin, God going to get you. God going to get you. He knows what you are. He knows what you did last week. He, said, he knows what you did last summer. And if you don't, hellfire is waiting to take you. Hellfire is that. No, no. There is, therefore, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. That doesn't give us the license to sin. That gives us a guardrail. God uses love and fear to keep us in our place. Love and fear. Just like a good father will. Uh, you use love and fear. I have to use that on, 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 on a little, 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 little grandchild. Now listen. If you do that again, you have to deal with me. With the most bass I can have in my voice. Listen. Two years old. Listen. If you do that again, you're going to have to deal with me. I will not tolerate that. Fear. I'm putting fear. Oh, you shouldn't do. I'm putting fear in that child's heart. So she understands, don't play with me. But then I give her a hug. And I know I love you. That's the way God does us. Amen. Amen. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2 says this. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, a brethren, let me see that word, brethren, talk about those who have been saved. How have they been saved? By the mercies of God. The mercies of God is your election. People don't like to hear that, but God elected to save you before you even existed. Your election, your justification, and eternal protection. He, he, he elected you. He, he saved you, and now he's protecting you. In light of that, 
to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. It's not the day you worship. It's are you worshiping him in your body, in our bodies? That's it. God is not going to come and destroy the world because people didn't keep the Sabbath. He's going to, did he destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because they didn't keep the Sabbath? No, he destroyed it because of immorality. The highest form of worship is denying self and living for the glory of God. We die to self by not loving the world and trusting Jesus Christ. He said he has given us everything we need for righteousness and godliness, Right? When did he give it to you? The moment you believe. You already have it. So you have to believe that in order to, in order to overcome sin. You don't overcome sin by doing the best you can. You overcome sin by faith. Verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed or become more like Christ. How? By the renewing of your mind. So that you may approve or understand and comprehend, comprehend what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. The more you look at Christ beholding him, you become changed. Well, where do you see Christ? In the word. The word, be, the, the word was with God, the word was God, and the word became flesh. When we read the Bible, it's amazing to me that people who are Christians, they say, I pray all the time. Oh, I'm, you know, I'm doing all of this. We're working. We're serving the community. My question is, do you love the word of God? If you don't love the word of God, you need to check yourself before you wreck yourself. Check yourself, because all those who love God love his word. When you got that little letter back in the day, when they used to put perfume on it, and you got it through the mail, did you set it aside? What did you do? You got to your secret place and read that letter, didn't you? How many times? I don't know who you love by what you do. And so I'm not here to judge you. I'm just saying we grow in the love of God the more we read the word of God. And sometimes it's hard to, I guarantee you, sometimes you may fall asleep reading the word of God. And people will put condemnation. You shouldn't be falling asleep. That's the word of God. Well, let me tell you something. Doesn't the word of God bring you comfort? And the more you read it, the more endurance you will get. Because the more you read it, you go, hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I never saw that before. Wait a minute. And the next thing you know, you'd be like me, talking to the wall. What? You mean, what? You mean, Lord, that's amazing. Nobody in the room. Not only are we to comprehend the will of God, but we are to be doers of the word. Amen? Amen. Ephesians 4 verse 24 says, and put on the new self which is in the likeness of God, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. He said, put it on, put it on. It's already in you, now just put it on. Therefore, now here we go. Here, watch your feet, watch your feet. Therefore, lay aside falsehood. Speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. In other words, don't, let's not lie to one another. The MacArthur Study Bible Commentary says this. More than simply telling direct falsehoods, lying also includes exaggeration and adding fabrications to something that is not true. There's something, fabrication to something that is true. Cheating, taxes, all that, cheating, making foolish promises, betraying a confidence, making false excuses are all forms of lying with which Christians should have no part. Amen. It gets quiet when we start talking about our sins. But remember, we do this not in order to be saved, but because we are. It is our responsibility to make sure our practice matches our position. Our position in Christ will never change. Get that? You got that? Your position in Christ should, will never change, but your practice in Christ should be growing in godliness more and more and more. Verse 26, be angry. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Then the scripture said I could be angry and yet do not sin. What do you mean? Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Well, can I have 
28 hours? Give me 14. Verse 27. And do not give the devil an opportunity. The longer we hold on to anger, the more we give the devil an opportunity to plant bitterness in our hearts. This is not a, see, so I'm saying this is not us. This is not you. This is not what we do. And this is what you have the capability of doing, being angry and not sin. Even if you're angry because of what the government is doing or you see someone doing something wrong and you know it's wrong, you acknowledge it and then you let it go. Why? Because we are to pray. For, how can you pray for somebody you're angry with? Hard, isn't it? Because the words don't mix. <laughs> Verse 28. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather be must he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. So in other words, when God transforms the life, even the life of a thief, that person now in love wants to do something for one of the people of God. You see that? That's the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. The end goal of a life transformed by God is faith expressing itself in love. Verse 29. Let no unwholesome word, that is of poor quality, bad, unfit for use, worthless, proceed from your mouth. But only such a word as is good for edification or building up another's growth in Christian wisdom, piety, happiness, and holiness, according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace or benefit to those who hear. It's so easy to use words that the society or the culture says is okay. But when God is transforming us, we should find ourselves doing that less and less and less. Amen. Amen. Somebody. So we are to, this is, why? Because this is not who we are. We don't talk like the world. You know, this one little boy, he said, my father cussed me so much, I didn't know my first name was God. I didn't know that my first name wasn't God. Get it? Okay. He didn't know. It's amazing. We want the children not to do it, so if we don't want them to do it. Why? Because we die to ourselves. We die. Remember, the flesh is not, the flesh is still the flesh. We fight the flesh. Again, here, I'm not here to condemn you, but I'm here to remind you that you already have the victory over it. Amen. Amen. Verse 30. Amen. Amen. All right. Oh, here's the big one. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. That's right there. That, oh, we can stop right there. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit because if you grieve the Holy Spirit, he'll leave you. I've heard that the Holy Spirit will leave you if you grieve him. But that's not what the scripture says. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. By whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Someone ought to shout right there. You are sealed by the Holy Spirit and he ain't letting you go. God the Father is not going to let you go. And Jesus Christ himself sure not going to let you go. So don't let some charlatan come up to you saying you can lose your salvation because it is impossible because you were sealed for the day, for the day of redemption. What is that day when Jesus Christ comes and the dead in Christ shall rise and we all in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, we shall all be changed and we'll all be given new bodies. Our flesh will be redeemed and we will be totally in the image of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a day that will be. Now, notice, in the middle of his instructions for godly living, godly living, I went a little southern on you, godly living. In the middle of his instructions for godly living, Paul reminds us that we are to live this way, not in order to be saved or to stay saved, but because we are saved. That's what it says right there. In the midst of fighting the flesh, never forget that the ultimate victory has already been won in Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, verse 31, we're going to keep this going. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor or the shouting and outcry of controversy. We See, Christians shouldn't be in a line protesting nothing. Did Jesus go on the picket line? Did Paul go on the picket line? Huh? 
No, he said, don't, no, 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 no. We don't go as a church. We're not going to stand out in front of an abortion clinic just protesting. We go individually to women and we say, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. We don't have to prove how righteous we are because we're not apart from Jesus. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with malice. Verse 32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. You want to know if you say? You want to know if the Holy Spirit is living in you? You want to know? I'll tell you how you know. This right here. How you living and how you forgiving. That's what we're going to ask yourself. How am I living and how am I forgiving? Jesus Christ Cleansed him. He died for your sins before you asked him to. Matter of fact, matter of fact, he saved you. He determined to save you before you asked him to. Well, they, if they don't, if they, oh, uh, oh. Uh, well, they, they're going to have to ask for it. Uh. Did you ask for forgiveness before God saved you? So, did, 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 did he? Did he? When did he, it says, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. When did God give himself up for her before the church even existed? So therefore, if we are true Christians, we learn how to forgive. Now, get me to hear me now. I'm not saying we do this perfectly. I'm not saying we're going to do this perfectly, but we have changed direction and we're walking in a new direction. We're no, long, no longer walking as the Gentiles. We are walking in the newness of life. And the more we learn to forgive, the more we know that the spirit of God is living in us. We are working out our salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who works in us to will and to do his good pleasure. That's how you know. Not the day you worship, not doing all of this. That has nothing to do with nothing. It's not your baptism. It's not your speaking in tongues. It's none of that. Are you living as God would have you to live? Because a transformed life is the proof of our salvation. And you grieve over your sin. Even though you know you've been forgiven, you still grieve over your sin. Have you ever read the scripture and you read something and it reminds you of yourself B.C., before Christ. And then sadness comes in your heart because you say, oh God, I'm so sorry for acting as a fool, as if there was no God. But then the Holy Spirit reminds you that that what you used to be, but you were washed. You were sanctified by the washing of the word and the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. And you are now a new creation. So don't forget the past. Let the past remind you of who you are in Christ today. I'm done. But I know the Holy Spirit is not done working in us. Amen. Father, in Jesus name, we come. Thank you, Lord, that you cause us to give us all to give all of ourselves to you. And so, Lord, in response to this message, Lord, we surrender all. And we do it by faith, knowing that we can't do it in our own. We, our flesh doesn't want to do it. But we thank you that you've given us a new heart and a new mind. And we want to do it the part that will live forever. We thank you, Lord, that we are your children. And it is our desire to represent you well here in this world. Lord, we thank you for so great a salvation. And we thank you in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.